Hello. We're glad you join us for this live webinar, Investigating the Genetics of Human Macrophage Response and Resistance to Mycobacterium Tuberculosis with Amplicit Gene Expression Panels. I am Marjorie Torres of LabRoots, and I'll be the moderator for this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars advancing scientific collaboration and learning. It's brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific Ion Torrent. Thermo Fisher Scientific Incorporation is the world leader in serving science with revenues of $18 billion and more than 55,000 employees globally. Their mission is to enable their customers to make the world healthier, cleaner, and safer. They help their customers accelerate life sciences research, solve complex analytical challenges, improve patient diagnostics, and increase laboratory productivity. Through their premier brands, Thermo Scientific, Applied Biosystems, Invitrogen, Fisher Scientific, and Unity Lab Services. They offer an unmatched combination of innovative technologies, purchasing convenience, and comprehensive support. To learn more, visit www.thermofisher.com. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them in the Q&A box, which will open when you click the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. Enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at lower left. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. I now present today's speaker, Audrey Papp. Audrey Papp Hi. is a research specialist oh. and technical <laughs> director of the Pharmacogenomics Coral Laboratory at the Ohio State University College of Medicine Center for Pharmacogenomics. As technical director, Audrey played a leading role in implementation of next generation sequencing in the pharmacogenomics core laboratory. In her career, Audrey has been successful at design and implementation of new concepts and programs in both research and clinical areas. Previously a supervisor of the Clinical Molecular Pathology Laboratory in the Department of Pathology at the Ohio State University Medical Center. She played a key role in developing the test portfolio and establishing the Molecular Pathology Laboratory as a CLIA certified lab. Audrey Papp will now begin her presentation. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Marjorie, and uh, thank you for LabRoots for doing this educational webcast and for Thermo Fisher Ion Torrent for inviting me to do it. And I think everybody already got a lot of information. So, um, so I do want to say that I don't work for Thermo Fisher and neither I nor any of our lab members receive any comp compensation for doing this. Um, and also just the legal disclaimer that Thermo Fisher Scientific is really not responsible for the work that I'm presenting. This is from our lab. So um, today I'm going to talk about a project that's fairly new to our lab. Um, we're investigating the genetics of human macrophage response and resistance to mycobacterium tuberculosis, and we're using Amplicite gene expression panels to do that. Um, and in spite of my disclaimer, we actually are an ion torrent certified service provider or a fairly small research core lab, but we did have to pass fairly rigorous proficiency testing to be designated as a certified service provider. So to get to my talk, um, it's a pretty packed talk. Um, I'll be talking first a little bit about the epidemiology and biology of tuberculosis and the host response. And then I'll look at our approach to the experiments, to looking at these host responses, and I'll be look, using, uh, looking at the Amplisic human transcriptome analysis and then different ways that we're analyzing that. 
And then another thing that I hope to leave you with is information on how to use some of the other essentially free databases that are out there. Um, if you're generating your own data, there's just a wealth of information that you can use to um, help form and, and test your hypotheses. So to get to the talk, um, here, here in Columbus, Ohio, when I say I'm investigating, looking at tuberculosis, a lot of people say, why are you doing that? You know, we thought that that was cured. But the truth is, it's really, it's a huge global problem. I mean, there are 1.3 million deaths per year. This was in 2012. Um, it's just up to 30% of the population is infected with TB. So although it might not be prevalent in the exact location where you're at, it is, it's, a, it's a big problem. It's a big problem. So, and part of the problem with tuberculosis is, is it's a little bit insidious. Um, people are exposed to TB, to the bacteria. Um, it's airborne. Some people are exposed and they're not infected. So about 10 to 20% of the people se seem to be naturally resistant. And then the people that are infected who um, have a latent TB infection, most of them it doesn't progress. So you can't even tell they're infected unless you do some additional testing. Um, and they may, may never have symptoms of tuberculosis. They're just silently carrying it. Um, there is a, vac a vaccine that can be given, the BCG vaccine. And this is a really good vaccine for infants and for children. It protects against the extra pulmonary tuberculosis, and it protects against a lot of other infectious diseases. But it seems to lose its protection in adulthood. So the BCG vaccine is really good for kids, um, but it doesn't protect against pulmonary tuberculosis in adults. And maybe a little bit worse is then the most common way for testing for tuberculosis presence is to test and see if there's an antibody response. And everybody that's been given this BCG vaccine has an antibody response so that they look like they're infected whether they are or not. So it's really hard to tell the difference between somebody that is just reacting to the vaccine or um, actually has tuberculosis. So there's a real need for better vaccines for tuberculosis, things that will protect protect against pulmonary TB in adulthood, and even protect against infection in the first place. So that's kind of where we're approaching it from a genomic standpoint. And part of the problem is that human variation affects the susceptibility and response, um, both to tuberculosis and to the vaccines. So for our particular project, our goal is to identify common genetic variants and response gene networks across the population that contribute to these variations that impact tuberculosis. Um, and we also want to validate these variants as functional biomarkers. So ideally, you could test for these particular variants, have a biomarker panel that would guide in both the um, development of vaccines by identifying specific types of pathways to target in particular people, and also target better treatment for people that are infected and even to potentially who, to predict who might, in fact, pro progress from latent TB to pulmonary TB or not. Um, so our project, Alveolar Macrophage Immunobiology and Functional Genomics, unlocking human-to-human -human variation in host response to M. tuberculosis. And this is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And this is kind of the, the brainchild of both Larry Schlesinger, um, who was here at Ohio State University until just recently, and also um, my boss, Wolfgang Sade. So Larry is the microbiologist, and Wolfgang is the genomics person. And what we're doing is taking human alveolar macrophages, that essentially the first cell involved in MTB infection. We're taking these from normal donors, and we're looking at both the RNA and the genomic DNA, and we're looking at responses to infection of these cells with tuberculosis 
we're measuring some of the cellular phenotypes, including the uptake of the bacteria and the survival of the bacteria and the growth. And we're trying to pull that all together to find candidate genes that are involved in these expression pathways and then find the functional genetic variants in these exact samples. So the nice thing is we have specific samples um, and we can look at the specific genetics and the response and the bacterial growth in these samples. So the basis for this um, is MTB cell association and growth and being able to relate that. So the time course of MTB infection, initially the bacteria just sit on the cell, um, on the macrophage, and then phagocytosis, they're taken up. And then in the next 24 hours, the bacteria and the cell adapt to the MTB infection, so different biochemical and genetic processes. And then after that, MTB starts growing. And one of the advantages that our team has is Larry's group has a lot of work, has done a lot of work with this chemiluminescent MTB bacteria. So it's been engineered that it will create chemiluminescent, so you can use that to actually measure the amount of bacteria that are, that are in the cells. So for these experiments, we're looking at the light units produced by the bacteria, and we're looking at two hours to look at the phagocytosis. We're looking at 24 hours to look at the adaptation, and then we're looking at the growth at 48 and 72 hours so we can look at the proliferation of the cells and, and see how they're doing, again, in these individual donors. Um, and just without even going into the expression analysis of this data, we've done 28 donors so far, and one interesting thing is just looking at the uptake. Already, there appear to be two distinct groups of individuals, one high uptake group and one low uptake group. And there's not much overlap between them. So this is one of the things that we're looking at. And here I want to mention um, Abul Azad, who is the PhD um, that has worked with Larry Schlesinger and moved with Larry to Texas Biomedical Institute, who is doing all of the MTB um, cellular infection experiments so another, again, just interesting pattern. This is now looking at the growth in the macrophages. And what you can see from this is if you look at the stars, um, most of the samples, most of the, the um, cell cultures have a pretty similar pattern. But once again, there are a couple of a couple of individuals that are outliers where there's either greatly decreased growth in that 24 to 72 hour period or there's increased growth. And once again, we think this is due in part to the genetic background. This is in tissue culture dishes now. So it's most likely to be the genetics that are influencing this. So a key part of what we're doing is looking at the gene expression. Um, and a lot of times people ask me, why are we using ion ampliseq transcriptomes for this? There are lots of transcriptome methods. Um, and one of the bottom lines is that we, honestly, we really, really like this assay. Um, part of it is it's just, it's a really easy assay to do. It's a one tube assay for the most part. So you take your RNA and you need 10 nanograms or less of RNA and you put your RNA in a tube and then you make a master mix, and for all of you samples, you add that same master mix to the tube. So everything gets treated to the same. Then you do some incubation, you make another master mix, and you add that to the same tubes. Um, these go, um, they amplify for 12 to 16 cycles, so not a lot. Um, and then you make another master mix and add that to all of the tubes then you put in your specific adapters. And all of this time, this has been in a single tube. You're not taking out, you're not putting back, you're not cleaning, you're not treating anything any differently. So it's a very um, kind of satisfying assay to do in the lab because you're just not worried about too much besides getting your, you know, your volume into the tube. 
and this in our lab is done for the most part by Mandy Williams, um, and she is just she's the hands and the heart of our lab, and you see her picture down in the corner. So, um, AmpliSeq, what do you what do you get with AmpliSeq transcriptomes? Um, you get about 21,000 transcripts, human genes assayed. It's a, a gene detection. It uses sequencing. So it's a digital detection. It's not analog. It's digital. You can count the number of reads. That helps make it quantitative. And we see it easily over five orders of magnitude. It's quantitative. It's linear. Um, the amplicons are small so that you can use them in fairly degraded samples. Now, they align to a bed file, a data file that's very specific for the amplicons, the AmpliSeq amplicons. So this is using the human genome as a reference and then looking for the specific amplicon locations in the human genome. And this is also, these, these replicates just correlate amazingly well, both between library replicates and between sequencing chips. And then one last thing, I just had um, reason to, to look at gene clusters. It seems like in these immunogenes and inflammatory genes, there are a lot of clusters of genes that seem to be produced by duplications and replications trying to fine tune the expression. So this particular cluster is a triggering receptor expressed in monocytes, the TREM gene cluster. And there are like eight TREM genes that are all very similar. So in looking at our results, I wanted to make sure that these TREM genes were, in fact, that we were getting the TREM genes that we thought that we were. So this little um, picture at the bottom just shows where the forward and reverse primers are placed in the AmpliSeq panels. And this is just, this is, again, this is available from Ion Torrent on their AmpliSeq page. So this is available information. But what we... What I found out, what I can see, is that they've been designed to pick up very specifically the different genes. Um, and they're also designed very specifically to pick up the functional isoforms. So this, again, this is just reassuring in the context of the biology that we're looking at, that we're in fact looking at the important gene transcripts with this AmpliSeq panel. So this is an example of some of the first data that we got on the macrophage RNA um, and a couple of things that um, I wanted to sort of point out, some things that I look at. These read length histograms um, here, you can see that the, the amplification, the, the primers, the size is very consistent. These look really nice. The distribution of the end-to-end -end reads is good. Um, but something that I wanted to share with you that is really just based on our experience, our experience um, I wanted you to see, this is just, this is a really good example. If you look at this number of targets detected, that's the number of uh, actual gene transcripts that are detected. Just, if you look at this one with the dotted red line here, uh, you see that there are 53% of the targets detected. And this is about four and a half million reads. Um, here you see that there are 58% of the targets detected, so about a 5% increase. And the number of reads is about doubled. So this is a rule of thumb that actually I find that we can use pretty broadly is that for these AmpliSeq transcriptomes, essentially after about a million reads, every time you double the number of reads, you get about a 5% increase in the number of targets that you detect. So to me, this is a kind of a, a good rule of thumb if you're doing these. A lot of times the question is, how deep do I need to sequence? How many reads do I need? And of course, the answer is always, it depends on how, you know, how low a transcript level you want to detect. But in general, you're only going to gain about 5% more at that low end if you double your number of reads. So that's just a, a secret that I'm imparting to everybody on this webinar. Um, so another reason that we like AmpliSeq, this is characterizing, it, it's looking at the normalization of the transcriptomes. 
and the top panel, um, this is done by Sam Handelman, who's now, uh, the analysis is done by Sam Handelman, who's now at Wayne State University. But if you normalize the Amplisic transcriptome reads, they normalize very, very well with a standard deviation, even over 12 full from 1 to 12 million reads with a standard deviation of about 11%. Um, percent. So this is actually, this is very tight, very good normalization, so that when you're trying to compare samples with different number of reads, um, you need about 20, with about 20 to 25 samples, you essentially have the power to detect your expression changes confidently. And the difference, this is the lower panel, is RNA-seq. This, again, this is from the Genotype Tissue Expression Database. This is just, again, available data. This is done by the Broad Institute. It's not by our lab. And they are just the gold standard of sequencing. But if you look at the normalization of whole transcriptome RNA-seq, you get almost a 50%, a 47.5% standard deviation. So it really means that you need more reads and you need way more samples in order to get a very confident um, measure of changes in your gene expression. So one of, again, just to you know, kind of reiterate, one of the great benefits of AmpliSeq is it's so stable and it's so consistent and so reproducible that we can get by with many fewer samples and, and feel like we can measure significant changes in gene expression. So if you can't tell, we really like this assay for gene expression. Um, so uh, why is normalization important? Why, uh, why do we want to look at normalization and read counts and differences? And uh, the bottom line is in most experiments, you're looking at changing conditions and you want to see differentially expressed genes. What changes um, when you add some sort of, what when you're looking at a response, what changes? So we use differential expression. We calculate the significance of the difference in the expression changes. And in order to do that, we also need to normalize those read counts um, so that, like I said, we're confident that we're looking at real changes in gene expression. So another just sort of setting the stage for why it's important to have a good normalization of the gene expression. And a lot of people ask, what's the best method? You want to look at differentially expressed genes. What's the best way to do that? Um, and unfortunately here, there's no really best answer. This is just, this is taking some of our macrophage data, and this is Sheely Lin is a professor um, of statistics at Ohio State University, and Xiao Fei is one of her students who's been analyzing our data. And what they looked at is using four different methods of calculating differential expression. Essentially, they got four different sets of results, and each, each method gave about 700 and or so genes, but they weren't always the same genes. So overall, this gave us about 1,200 genes that looked like they were differentially expressed. Um, and the overlap between those was about 300 or about 25%. So kind of what I intend as a take-home message is that if you're looking at differential expression, if you want to cast a broad net, and not miss too much, then you probably want to look at different ways of calculating differential expression and take those into account. And if you want to narrow it to your most relevant, most important candidates, you probably, again, want to use many methods, but then you can limit it to only the overlaps of those genes. So again, another example, these are in our first, I think, 10 alveolar macrophage samples. And something that struck me right away with this is that you can see that when we cluster this, and this is using the Torrent Suite software, no, I mean, no additional math. Um, when we cluster this, first of all, the samples break down by time point. 
So the cells, whether they're treated or not, you can divide them into the two-hour, the 72-hour, and the 24-hour time points. So most things are happening to most cells similarly. And then an additional breakdown is that if you look at pairs of samples, so this is one example, and for the most part, if they're sequential, they're, they're pairs. In this case, seven is infected and eight is uninfected. Um, there's also the pairs cluster together more so than, the treat, than with the treatment itself, more so than whether they're infected or uninfected. So my, to me, the implication of this is that there's this overall transcriptomic response and that that's even more specific, the whole transcriptome response is specific to individuals. And then you get down to the very specific response, in this case, to MTB. So it's a much smaller number of genes that actually differentiate the response to tuberculosis or probably any other drug or condition. And in a way, this is reassuring if you're trying to figure out what are the most important genes that you have to look at. So it looks like it's not this 22,000. It actually does boil down to a much smaller number that's relevant. So again, going from our specific data, we're plugging our differential expression analysis into integrated pathway analysis, just IPA. And one of the things that came up in just our, our first experiments is one of the pathways um, looking at cell-cell signaling and interactions, there was a difference between several of the donors. And this slide is a little bit fuzzy, but I think that you can see that here IL-10, this is interleukin-10, is kind of a hub gene that's triggering this in one, one set of donors. And here, it's interferon gamma that's triggering a different, if it's a different hub that's triggering a different set of genes being upregulated and downregulated. And this is, this is interesting in part because interferon gamma is actually pro-inflammatory and IL-10 is an anti-inflammatory molecule. So, and both of these have been implicated in tuberculosis already. So one of the things, um, kind of the, the next part of the talk, is I want to show you how we followed up specifically on interleukin-10 to see whether there might be very specific variants that are important in this TB response. So this, it's a, a lot of words on this slide. The bottom line is that IL-10 influences three important functions of the monocytes. It influences the release of immune mediators. It influences antigen presentation and also phagocytosis, the uptake. And it acts to suppress most of these functions. So it's an anti-inflammatory sort of molecule that we're looking at. Um, and I'm going to walk you through some of the databases that we used to dig into this, but I want to give you a few just few definitions just in case you're not used to the jargon of, of you know, uh, our discipline. So looking at quantitative trait locus, um, this is really looking at a section of DNA that correlates with some variation in phenotype. So that's the quantitative trait is the variation in the phenotype, um, and then the DNA is the locus. And if we're looking at expression quantitative trait loci, or EQTLs, we're looking at how that locus, how that section of DNA affects RNA expression levels. So I think I'll probably throw out the EQTL words a lot, so that's what EQTLs are. Um, the Genotype Tissue Expression Database, it's a program from the Broad Institute, and we use this database really extensively. The online data resource you can go to, to through the GTEx portal, and it has just an abundance of data, of, you know, aggregated level data, and it's got statistics um, on the expression quantitative trait loci analysis. Um, another jargon, or GWAS, 
um, looking at genome-wide association studies. They are looking at common genetic variants to see if in different individuals, usually many different individuals, to see if any of the genetic variants are associated with a measured trait. And then last on this page, dbGaP is the database of genotypes and phenotypes, and it's just a repository for all of these GWAS results. So you, whoever is listening, can access these databases and use this information to look at your gene expression and to look at your traits and try and correlate things, which is what we did with IL-10. And just one more example, and to me this, this makes a, a really good, gives a really good picture of why gene expression is important. If you look at the gray, gray dots, this is from GTEx, each dot represents an EQTL locus, so a, a locus that's linked with changes in RNA expression. And then underneath, if you look at the turquoise bars, those are, tra those are genetic loci that are linked with phenotypes, with human phenotypes. And to me, the most striking part of this, so you can see all of the circles, is how often the expression traits, the expression levels, are linked to loci that also have phenotypes, that have GWAS phenotypes. So this implies very strongly that changes in RNA expression are actually responsible for the changes in the phenotypes of the, the participants. So this is one of the reasons why we think that expression and studying expression and genetic changes for expression is really important. So taking this to IL-10, again, you can do this for your favorite genes. IL-10, it looks like it's a pretty simple gene. These red dots are the EQTLs, and the higher or lower they are, the greater the, the p-value for them, the probability that they're significant. And these all look about the same. Um, and if you look at the GWAS hits from dbGaP, there's one in particular, this RS1518111 is the identifier. Um, it has the strongest expression quantitative trait locus, and it's also linked the most strongly to Bichette's disease, which is an autoimmune disease. So this is suggesting that IL-10 function is linked to, and expression is linked to some autoimmune diseases. This also, it's involved in Crohn's disease and other inflammatory diseases. Um, so. Again, it kind of makes sense. IL-10, interleukin-10 seems to be important in immune response. So if you dig deeper, though, I had thought in looking at this, I was going to be presenting a, a very easy um, resolution of, okay, this RS1518111 is a causative variant, and all of these other variants just travel with it on the same chromosome so that they're linked to it um, but not important. And the less linked they are, maybe the less important they are. But when I broke this down into different p-values into different groups, it really turned out that there are at least three groups of um, variants. And in fact, they're grouped according to different populations. So this RS1518111 was, had a very tight group in the African population, but that wasn't as tightly linked in the CEU in the European population. The linkage seemed to deteriorate between the, the green SNPs, and another one came up in the European population. Same thing, HCB is the Han Chinese population, and there's an entirely different group of variants that seem to be linked, again, to regulation of IL-10 expression. So even if it looks simple, it isn't. Um, so this slide, this is, this is about an hour's worth talk in itself, and I'm trying to give you a synopsis. The, the punchline is that there's an IL-10 splice variant 
that's influenced by this RS-1518111. And this is, this actually, it's most strongly related to RS-1518111. And when that is present, and also this additional variant is present, it makes a splice form that is a little bit longer and it's not functional. And in the African pop in the African population, these variants are very, very strongly linked. And this is this is a database called SNAP, if you can see in the bottom left corner. And I just drew a horizontal line showing you that the variants in this urban population, the African population, are tightly, tightly, they all occur together. Whereas you look at the same variants in the European population, and they don't. Um, and just to plug, this database is called SNAP. Um, and Andrew Johnson was a student of ours many years ago. He's now at NIH, and he developed this database. Um, but like I said, what this is telling us is there's this group of variants in the 5 prime end that act best, that have their best function when they're all together. And when they're all together, they make this new splice form that kind of diverts the interleukin-10 transcript into a non-productive transcript. So what this does is it potentially increases the immune response. So when you have these variants together, and then it potentially increases the immune response, so decreases the anti-inflammatory response in people that po possess this group of variants. So there, like I said, there, there were different variants that were linked in the, the European population and different variants that were linked and different mechanisms in different populations. And all of these seem to imply that nature is evolving different mechanisms in different areas of exposure to regulate the production of interleukin-10 in response to the circumstances. So just a little bit of follow-up on that particular variant, the 1518111. We collaborated with Kathy Stein. She has a, a very wonderful um, GWA study from Ugandan Africans looking at TB susceptibility in people that reside in the same household. And she shared her data with us. And in fact, in the South African population, you can see that these two variants occur with the same frequency and they're much more highly expressed. They occur much more frequently in the cases than in the controls so that it seems to be a very direct link to tuberculosis susceptibility in this population and these two variants. So again, it's all sort of pulling together this hypothesis that these variants are important in response to TB and particularly these variants in this linkage, which occurs most frequency, frequently in the African population. Okay, so that was a lot about how to use these databases and how to pull that data together. We have one more topic that I wanted to introduce you to, and this is to look at allelic expression analysis to very specifically test for the presence of variants that change expression. And we can do this, we've done this for many years, um, either using individual assays where we quantitate um, SNP by SNP, variant by variant, by measuring at heterozygous places in the RNA, looking at the way the RNA is expressed. Um, more recently, we did that with whole transcriptome sequencing. And the, sing the single uh, uh, variant approach is very precise. It's very accurate. The RNA-seq, total RNA-seq approach gives you a ton of information, um, but it needs a lot more reads and a lot more depth, and it's a lot more confusing. So what we've moved to, what we're just moving to, is looking at allelic expression. So looking at changes in RNA expression where 
there's a variant that we can differentiate the two alleles, one from mom, one from dad. We're looking at allelic expression assays, um, and we've designed to, we want to do this on our specific macrophages, on the macrophage RNA in our specific samples. So we have this RNA, we've infected the cells, and we have controls, and we have the time points, and we've used our bioinformatics to take our top 700 candidate genes. And Ion Torrent, um, in part in payback for me giving this webinar, agreed to do a white glove um, AmpliSeq assay development in order to test allelic expression. And we just got the results of the assay. We've got about our 700 genes designed for. Um, so we're going to use this AmpliSeq assay to look at allelic expression and to correlate it with the donor genotypes that we have in our specific donors and relate those to the individual functional variants. So we can trace this back not just to statistically, but individually we can look at the contribution of the genotypes to the RNA expression. So one last example, this is just an example of what we're looking at with the AmpliSeq design. Here are this, the dark lines represent areas of, of the transcript that are expressed in, in the RNA, the processed RNA. So what we're looking at are designing amplicons, having them design amplicons that surround um, variants, that surround common variants so that they would be heterozygous. So that's what our AmpliSeq design um, was for. We had done a previous design for, less, um, for fewer variants that looked promising, so now we're looking at about 700 genes. So just to summarize essentially some of the things that, that I hope I've conveyed in this talk, um, MTB is honestly a very important worldwide human pathogen, and we need to develop personalized vaccination and treatment for tuberculosis. Um, macrophages are the first responders for pulmonary TB, so that they're an important component both of susceptibility and also protection. Um, and there are inherent and very measurable differences in the macrophage responses to MTB, even in these 28 individuals that we've looked at so far. So overall, it looks like there's a, a big genetic component that we can potentially measure in MTB. And the way that we're doing it is using these AMPLICI transcriptome gene expression assays. Um, because they give us the sensitivity and reproducibility that we need without having to do hundreds to thousands of samples. And then based on the gene expression data and linking that to the biological data and then pulling in the information from the external databases, we can hone in pretty well on individual variants that seem to be important, that seem to be functional, and then retest that in those individuals that we have, and then apply that to the broader worldwide population. So again, just a summary of our project in general. We're looking at the associations between RNA expression and cellular responses to TB and macrophages then we're modeling our RNA expression networks to get our key genes. Then we're looking to identify genetic variants in those key genes. Then we're using uh, allelic expression and other assays to determine the effect of those specific variants. And then we're using the information from these large databases and associations to make it relevant to a larger population. And Hopefully, we can integrate all of this information to guide both development of vaccines and also to find an effective personalized treatment for tuberculosis. Okay, and these, um, Larry Schlesinger and Wolfgang Sade, are the PIs on this project, and a lot of help, a lot of informatics help, especially from Sheely Lin and Greg Rampala who are professors at Ohio State University. But the hands-on stuff 
everything that I've presented has been by these people, by Abul Azad and Mindy Williams, Xiaofei Zhao, Min Wang, Maciej Petrojic. Um, Kun Wang is also a professor, um, and Sam Handelman. And this project was funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. It is a pilot project, and we're hoping for more funding. So that's my talk. Thank you. Now we can open that for questions if you wish. Thank you, Audrey Pat, for your presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Audrey Pap will answer as many questions as time permits. The first question is, can this approach of combining genotype, cellular phenotype and expression be applied to other diseases? Oh, I think um, this would honestly, in my opinion, be kind of an obvious approach to other diseases. Cancer is, is one of them where you can look at a tumor versus a normal tissue, um, and you look, can look in that individual. But you could also look at drug treatments. I mean, anything where there's essentially a, a specific phenotype that you could test, I think this would be a good approach for. Thank you. The next question is, as a core lab, what projects have you seen where using a single analysis approach, say ion amplicyte transcriptome, has been sufficient? Um, it's more the single question where amplicyte gives a, a single answer. So again, I think one of the better examples is if you're looking to see how a drug affects the, the growth of a cell. Um, you can add the drug, use the amplice transcriptomes to look at gene expression and get a very clear-cut answer, um, very clear-cut um, measurement of how the gene expression has changed, what that drug has done. The next question is, have you used other sources of RNA outside of ham? Um, yeah, that's a good question. It's one of the things that we like AmpliSeq for a lot. Um, we've, we've used it with FFPE, formalin fixed paraffin embedded RNA. So this is usually a nightmare to look at with sequencing and with transcriptome expression because it's so degraded. Um, but with AmpliSeq, um, we've done studies with quite a few investigators now looking at RNA prepared from the FFPE, and it really works remarkably well. Um, you do need roughly 100 base pair fragments in order for AmpliSeq to work. And the other thing is it appears, and I'm not sure why, but it seems to me that AmpliSeq with FFPE works best on newer samples, and I don't know if it's the fixation methods or oxidation or something else, but um, over about five to ten years, after about five years, the number of targets that we detect goes down. Um, but the other, the other use that I'm kind of excited about that is just a very recent project is we're looking at some laser capture samples. And in these laser capture samples, we don't even have a measurable amount of RNA in the samples, but we are putting, we are performing the AmpliSeq transcriptome assay, and honestly, we're getting beautiful expression results. You know, full number of valid targets that we would expect from these unmeasurable amounts of RNA from the laser capture samples. So it's not quite single cell. I haven't, we haven't really applied it to single cell, but with laser capture and a very small number of cells and targeted cells, um, it seems to work really well. It looks like we have time for one more question. This is an interesting study. What is happening next in the project? Um, so we have uh, the biological responses. And I, I just showed you those brief slides where with phagocytosis um, and uptake and with growth curves, there seem to be differences in different individuals. So one of the first things that we're doing um, for this study is following up with the expression studies 
and the network studies and trying to figure out which genes are important for those phenotypes, for those biological phenotypes, for the uptake of the bacteria um, and for the growth of the bacteria in the macrophages. So those expression profiles and those expression analysis um, and uh, combining it with the biological is really the, the next step for us in trying to look at what genes are important and what variants then might influence that. Plus the allelic expression assays. I'm excited to see the results of those. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. I would also like to thank Audrey Pop for her presentation. We would like to we would also like to thank our sponsor, Thermo Fisher Scientific, Ion Torrent, for underwriting today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through December 2017. Labrits will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, goodbye. Bye, everyone.